I had a lot of fun researching the sermon, and I learned things I didn't know. So many things I thought I knew, but I didn't. Our founding fathers, of course, were fully human, having inconsistencies and paradoxes in their personalities and in their actions. They just were not always consistent in their thought, or maybe they simply evolved in their thoughts. So I'm preaching about the face of our founding fathers and mostly about the separation of church and state because it's important that all, as Unitarian Universalists, it is important for us to know some of this history so that we can have personal knowledge when we have these conversations with others. And I hope when you're having those specific conversations about we were founded on a Christian nation, I hope this sermon or history lesson will make you want to read more, and I recommend the book that's listed in your order of service under readings. I also, if you haven't got that kind of time, I really recommend this little small primer that has those original writings, The Separation of Church and State, and it's in the UU bookstore. I can't leave you mine because I just can't part with it. It's an election season, and we hear a lot about how the United States began as a Christian and God-fearing country. At least from a lot of people, we hear that. And that Christianity should influence political decisions today. But did we really start as a Christian nation? The American Revolution was not driven by an anti-religious pathos that spearheaded the French Revolution, but rather it was Jefferson's idea that a creator endowed us with inalienable rights. Liberty and equality came from, and I quote Jefferson, nature and nature's God. Many of our founding fathers were deists, so they believed in a creator. But basically, if I can boil this down to just a nutshell, the creator went through the universe flinging star stuff and then went on. There was no micromanagement and there is no salvation through Jesus. But it was nature and nature's God. And religious liberty was held as one of the inalienable rights. I think I already told you this, but today's sermon is based on the book and the order of service and then this small little primer. Boris Church, who wrote the primer and the other book, and John Behrens, who collaborated together sometimes. But Forest Church asserts that today, both the religious right, you're right, <laughs> and the secular left are often confused because they can't distinguish between the universal spiritual values that underlie the American experiment in democracy. So spiritual values and the role assigned to government to advance those same values by protecting freedom of conscience and belief, and belief of course being religious or non-religious. It's imperative as you use that we understand that the struggle with these questions of separation and church of state come from two different pillars of thought that interact with one another. First, there are, well, not first, but there are enlightenment values over here. And the second is Christian imperatives that came out of what was called the Great Awakening, which was a massive evangelical movement of the 1700s that just spread across the colonies. So according to Forest Church, together, both these pillars, both these schools of thought, brought in a collaboration about the establishment of the separation of church and state in America. And then enlightenment values emphasize this freedom of conscience that you hear over and over again as both a, both a political and a philosophical value, a virtue. It stressed freedom from the dictates of organized religion. These Enlightenment values were held by Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton, just to name a few, but I name those because they were primarily responsible in the drafting of our founding documents. Not solely, but primarily. 
So Enlightenment values emphasize freedom of conscience as both this political and philosophical virtue, stressing freedom from religion, and of course, persecution from religion. They preached a gospel of liberty. So there were also this other side, this evangelical movement, and what they wanted was freedom for religion. They also preached a gospel of liberty, that different religions should be able to flourish, not be persecuted and not be um, infringed upon by another. So I want to step back first to the pilgrims of Plymouth and mostly the Puritans at Massachusetts Bay. Both came across the Atlantic to find a place where they could practice their religions freely. I found Forest Church provides a great quote from President Howard Taft, who later says, these groups came to the country to establish freedom of their religion, not freedom of anybody else's religion. In fact, King James II in, 18, in, in 1684, temporarily revoked the Charter of Massachusetts due to those Puritans imposing religious restrictions on Protestants. And remember, Quakers were quite persecuted to the point of being put to death. So to get their charter reinstated, those Puritans had to allow Protestants to worship as they pleased. Even prior to that time in 1635, John Winthrop, the administrator of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, who I have tremendous mixed feelings about, he was a great administrator in so many ways and so confused in so many others. So he was the administrator of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and he threw out Roger Williams in the middle of winter, believing he would perish. However, some Native Americans took him in and helped him but he was thrown out by Winthrop because he was a Baptist. He was advocating religious freedom, which included, he felt very strongly about religious freedom for Native Americans. But Williams went on to establish Providence and Rhode Island and, and to have complete religious freedom there and was a good advocate for Native Americans. He had a, uh, friendships and working relationships and advocacy for them. William Penn went on to do the same in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So you can start to hear how our colonies wanted this religious freedom. And then we go to Virginia, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who were both entirely committed to religious liberty. Virginia had been known for its persecution of Quakers and for laws, there were so many laws about religious, but one of the laws that really struck me that it allowed for the removal of children from their parents if their parents were not engaged in the correct type of religious practices. Jefferson considered the struggle for religious freedom, and I quote, the severest context in which I have ever been engaged, end quote. And this can be heard in the testimony before Virginia's governing body. Quoting Jefferson, the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no God. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And he goes on to say, millions of innocent men, women, and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burned, tortured, fined, imprisoned. And yet, have we not advanced one, and, and yet we have not advanced one inch toward uniformity. What has been the effect of all that coercion? It makes half the word fools and the other half hypocrites. Jefferson, who most often referred to himself as Unitarian, did not believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection. And he simply cut them out of his Bible. He also removed any miracles. He scorned evangelists as, for their ignorance and chicanery. And he considered St. Paul to be a theological charlatan. He didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, but he 
he was deeply moved by the way Jesus had lived his life and saw Jesus as an exemplar for how we should live and that there was so much ethic to be learned from his teachings. Jefferson was good friends with Benjamin Rush. So Jefferson is the Unitarian, and Benjamin Rush is a Universalist. And he was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was one of the head physicians during the Revolutionary War. And he and Jefferson were friends during that time, and they were friends for many years afterwards. And when Jefferson um, was president, almost every evening after dinner, he and Benjamin Rush would get together and just talk. And in a letter that Jefferson is writing to Benjamin Rush, he says, I am Christian in the only sense that he, Jesus, wished anyone to be sincerely attached to his doctrines in preference to all others and ascribing himself to every human excellence, believing that Jesus never claimed any other. Jefferson was also a believer that it is deeds, not creeds that our lives and not our words is how our religion should be read. So Jefferson, Washington, and Madison all grew up as Episcopalian. And as adults, none of them joined a church. Which doesn't mean they didn't attend, they just never joined. Madison studied theology at Princeton, specifically scriptural and the historical relationship between civil and religious freedom. Washington went on to attend churches of several denominations, but he did not take communion at any of these churches and was called out by clergy for not doing so. It has been, I guess, theorized that Washington did not believe in the divinity of Jesus and therefore the communion would, would have been hypocritical for him. Meanwhile, John Adams, a Unitarian, was discussing the direct relationship between the colonists' worries about England infringing on their religious liberty, so Church of England, and the colony's growing urge toward rebellion. I'm, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going, to cut, I'm going to cut down a few of these bullet points. Some things for you to know, though, that it was Virginia's Baptists, not James Madison, who spearheaded the drive in our Constitution to have a Bill of Rights. It was the Baptist passion for freedom of conscience that led directly to the First Amendment. Also for you to know that while the Baptists wanted this church separation so clearly defined, Unitarians lined up on the other side. They wanted a place for God in government. Meanwhile, the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists hated the Declaration of Independence because they, the way it was written, the way it was written, because they felt it was subversive to Christian values. Congress eventually subcontracted to Christian denominations for aid in educating Native Americans which was the first instance of today's faith-based initiatives. And we know how horribly that turned out. Early in Jefferson's tenure, Alexander Hamilton, a non-practicing Christian, and really a lukewarm fan of the Constitution, but paradoxically, weirdly, he believed in establishing a Christian constitutional society so that they could lobby for prohibiting non-Christians from being able to have a national office. And a little later, James Monroe played a huge part. His Monroe Doctrine was above all just a moral manifesto designated to frustrate the ambitions of what was called the Holy Alliance, a, a European um, group that was founded to establish Christ as the cornerstone in international governance. And Moreau said, we are not having that come to our United States. So in regard to planting, to placing any religious language in our constitution, when all the debate was over, our constitution contains only one reference to religion and is found 
in the statement, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust in the United States. So that was also in Washington's letter to the Jewish community. And fun little fact, that during all those debates, a New Hampshire delegate spoke out fiercely about the lack of religious test for office. How could we let that happen? It would invite in Turks and Jews and Roman Catholics. And I quote, what is worst of all, a universalist may be president of the United States. <laughs> I can imagine that, that uh, <clears throat> the New Hampshire delegate was probably also pretty unhappy with Jefferson the Unitarian being in office. Another delegate stated a religious test would make us like England, where every person who holds public office must either be a saint by law or a hypocrite by practice. They had so many good little pithy things. I just like, it's fun reading them. But I know we want to go to soup. So lastly, I'm just going to leave you <laughs> with the words of founding father, John Leland. He was a 23-year-old Baptist minister. And he wrote tracts about um, the separation of church and state. So again, Leland, Baptist minister. Um, and I believe, he, I believe he was a ratifier of the Constitution. He says, the notion of a Christian commonwealth should be exploded forever. Government should protect every man in thinking and speaking freely and see that one does not abuse the other. The liberty I contend for is more than toleration. This is so important. The very idea of toleration is despicable. It supposes that some have a preeminence above the rest to grant an indulgence, whereas all should be equally free, Jews, Turks, pagans, and Christians. So I hope my fast-talking, little teeny, itsy-bitsy glimpse into this history will make you want to read more because it's so important that we have a little bit of this information stuffed in our pocket so we can converse with other people who don't know this history so that we can converse with them in an informative way. But now it's time for soup and bread and I also want you to make sure you get your pledge envelopes today. Uh, but my hope is, in the next few weeks of the election season and after the election, you can find yourself in conversations where you are able to quote Jefferson. And if any of you know this, I want you to say it with me, that it neither picks your pocket or breaks your leg if your neighbor believes in 20 gods or no god. Have fun with that. <laughs>